Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the basics of Trig and kind of like what Trig is all about. So first of all, what is the point of Trig, right? Um, so this is kind of a hard question to answer in a deep way, but in a superficial way, all right, at our level, the point of Trig we can think of as being the following. Uh, we want to figure out the sine, cosine, and tangent of all angles, right? So if you think about trig in that context, obviously it's not a complete answer, but I think that will get you pretty far um, because that pretty much is the goal of intro level trig. So let us get started here um, by sort of, well, the most basic thing that you can know would be Sokotoa, right? And I'll just write out the equations for that. So sine of any angle is opposite over hypotenuse. The cosine of an angle is adjacent over hypotenuse. And the tangent of an angle is opposite over adjacent, right? So you usually see that in uh, geometry uh, before we even learn anything about trig for the most part. Um, so from there, um, sometimes, you know, we're told to memorize certain values, um, but better than memorize is to actually come up with a scheme to remember everything. So first of all, we could start with the unit circle. Okay. So we have the unit circle. So we'll draw a circle here. And the reason why it's called a unit circle is because the radius of this circle is one, right? So it has a unit length, okay? Meaning just length of one. Um, all right, so there are four points that we're concerned with here. And those are the points where the circle meets the, um, meets the uh, grid lines, okay? So we have our x-axis here, y-axis here, negative x, negative y. Um, so let's start with this point here in the right-hand side. If you notice, the coordinates of this point would be, it would be over by an amount one and up and down by an amount zero. And I'll just write down the coordinates for each of these points. This is over zero and up one. This is left one and up and down zero. And then this one is uh, over by zero and down by one. Um, now, the interesting thing about the sine and cosine in this context is that if you look at the x and y values uh, of these points, they actually will tell you the cosine and sine respectively. So for example, uh, this would be the cosine of theta, and this one would be the sine of theta. So now you might wonder, like, OK, what is theta? Where is that coming from? So if we imagine almost like um, one of those board games where you kind of flick the spinner and it kind of spins around. You can imagine a line coming from the origin and extending out to this point, okay? Um, you can think of this as a vector if you know what vectors are from geometry or physics. Um, but yeah, for now, we could just think of it as a little line that extends out to the right. Um, this is, you know, one of the two rays that form an angle, the other of which would be the x-axis. So if you ask yourself, you know, with this red line and green line representing the x-axis and the vector respectively, um, what is the angle in between those? The answer would be zero degrees, right? So in this case, we're really looking at the cosine of zero degrees and the sine of zero degrees, okay? This will become a little more clear when we look at the next example, which is this point. Um, but for now, what we can realize is that the cosine of zero is the x coordinate here, so that has to be one, and the sine of zero is the y coordinate, which means it has to be zero, okay? So let's go on to the next point, and I think it'll become a little more clear what's going on here. So I draw my vector now going up to the top, and now I'm just gonna remove this red line, okay? So now, if I measure the angle between the uh, vector, let's say, 
and the x-axis, because we always measure angles with respect to the x-axis, the positive x-axis, right? Um, in this case, we get 90 degrees, okay? So what that tells us is that this happens to represent the cosine of 90 degrees, and the y-coordinate represents the sine of 90 degrees, okay? So what we just learned is that the cosine of 90 is zero and the sine of 90 is one, okay? So we know the cosine and sine of those values. All right, and we can continue on the left-hand side here. So if we go over to the left-hand side and I'm just gonna remove this red line. Okay, now if we look at the angle, the angle is going to measure 180 degrees. So we see that this would be the cos of 180 and this would be the sine of 180, right? Now I haven't fully explained why it is that um, these X and Y values represent the cosine and sine. Um, that's a little bit trickier to explain. So I'll explain maybe that in a minute, but first let's finish up what we're doing here. So the last step would be to go downwards here with our sort of vector and you could draw an arrow at the end of it if you're used to working with vectors. Um, and now if we look at the angle here, notice that we're starting at the positive X axis. We're going all the way around to here. So this one actually measures 270 degrees. So the X value would represent cos of 270 and the Y value is the sine of 270, right? Now, if you know about um, angles, we measure positive angles uh, with respect to the positive X axis moving in a counterclockwise direction. But if we were to move in a clockwise direction, all right, and I'll do this maybe in a different color. So if we were to move in a clockwise direction, then this would represent negative angles, right? So this would have been, for example, negative 90 degrees. And so what you see here is that um, the cosine of 270 happens to be zero, but so does the sine, or excuse me, the cosine of negative 90, okay? So there's two different ways of measuring each angle. You can measure the positive angle or the negative angle, all right? So keep that in mind uh, for later. Um, so at this point, if we kind of summarize what we have so far, right, um, as far as the sines and cosines, we have the sine and cosine of the following values. We have zero degrees, whoops, um, we have 90 degrees, we have 180 degrees, and 270, right? So we'll fill in this little chart here. Uh, let's see, the sine and cosine of zero. So the sine of zero is zero, the cosine of zero is one. Uh, for 90 degrees, the cosine is zero and the sine is one. For 180, the cosine is negative one and the sine is zero. And for 270, it's the other way around, okay? So we're building up our knowledge of trying to figure out all the values of sine and cosine. And eventually we'll get to tangent as well. And by the way, it's not so hard to do because we know that tangent is equal to sine over cosine, right? For a particular angle, the tangent is just sine divided by cosine. So for example, we could see immediately how we would get this by just dividing zero divided by one is zero. This one is undefined, right? Because we're dividing one over zero. Um, and then here we would get zero once again. And then here, once again, we get undefined, okay? So yeah, we can expand to include the tangent as well. Once we realize we could just divide the sine and cosine. Um, okay, so, so far so good. We have four angles, right? We know the value of four angles. So in order to continue here, um, we can expand this by looking at some of the angles on the inside. And for that, we'll have to remember our idea of special right triangles. Okay, so special right triangles. So for starters, we have the idea of the isosceles right triangle. So if we assume, let me try to make it a little more symmetrical. Uh, if we assume that these legs are equal, right? Um, then we know that uh, these angles have to be equal. Therefore, they both have to be 45 degrees, assuming this is 90. Uh, so we have what's called the 45, 45, 90 triangle. And when we have this triangle, we understand that if I know this is five, for example, then first of all, this has to also be five because we have an isosceles triangle effectively, right? So 
whatever value you get for the side opposite of 45 degrees, the other um, leg of the triangle will also be that same value. And then the hypotenuse, if you recall, right, we could do five squared and five squared um, is x squared or c squared, if you will. Um, so it's just Pythagorean theorem, basically, letting this be c. So we end up getting this. And then we get, for c, we get, um, whoops, we get the square root of 50, right, when we square root both sides. Now, typically we would get a decimal here, but um, it's better if we simplify this radical into 25 times 2. Uh, then we end up getting the square root of 25 is 5, so 5 rad 2. And the reason why this is so useful is because we see how this number enters in, right? So if we would have used 10 initially, we would have ended up with 10 rad 2. And if we would have used x, we would have ended up with x rad 2. Okay, you could try that out for yourself and see that it works. So anyway, we get a formula here, which was always true that we have x, x, x rad 2. So that's like a, the ratio of sides uh, whenever we have a special right triangle. And another way you can come to that uh, idea is you can just remember that you can sort of double this and this triangle would be similar. So it would have to have, you know, all the sides being doubled, right? Um, so you can sort of abstractify that into this formula that the ratio of sides would always be x, x, x rad two. All right, so why do, how does this help us? Well, if you recall, um, basically the sign we remember is opposite over hypotenuse, right? So let's say we want to know the sine of 45 degrees. Well, we can actually look at this angle here, let's say, for argument's sake. So if I look at this angle, we see that the opposite would be 5, and the hypotenuse would be 5 rad 2, right? So we can do 5 over 5 rad 2. And in general, it's always going to be x over x rad 2, OK? So Notice the x's will cancel, so we end up with 1 over rad 2. But since we don't like to have square roots in the bottom, we do what's called rationalize the denominator. Multiply by rad 2, rad 2, uh, top and bottom. So we end up with rad 2 over, and then this just becomes 2. All right, so this is going to be the answer when it comes to the sine of 45 degrees. Now, I could have done the same thing for cosine of 45, uh, and I would have got the exact same value because uh, the adjacent of this is also going to be 45, and the hypotenuse, once again, or sorry, is going to be um, 5 or x, and the uh, hypotenuse is going to be 5 rad 2 or x rad 2. So you get the same fraction. So this is going to end up being the same value. Okay, and uh, so now we know the value of 45 degrees. So we're building up our knowledge of the sine and cosine of all possible angles. Okay, that's the whole point. Um, so just to recap, we have so far 0, 90, 180, 270. And now we're kind of working in that first quadrant range to try to find some stuff in the middle. Um, so uh, for example, we just figured out 45 degrees. So if I kind of come back to our chart here, whoops. Let me just erase a couple things. OK, so we just figured out 45 degrees, which was halfway in between here. We figured out the cosine and the sine. So they were both rad 2 over 2. OK, and this is for 45 degrees. So now what I want, want to do next is basically figure out uh, a couple more values on the interior here. For example, 30 degrees and 60 degrees. OK. So, so far we have, as you notice, one, two, three, four, five. So we just want to keep filling in as many of these dots as possible around this unit circle. So the next special right triangle that I can look at is uh, what's called the 30, 60, 90 triangle, okay? And for this one, basically, we would go like this, okay? And you can think of this as actually being sort of a uh, from an equilateral triangle perspective, it's kind of just the right half, okay? Um, actually, let's keep that up because that'll help us figure it out. Um, so for example, if we were to let this be x, right? We notice immediately that, whoops, that this would have to be 2x, right? And the reason why that's true, it's not perhaps obvious, but um, the green triangle, the one I'll outline here in yellow, this one, is 
um, an equilateral triangle, right? So we have 30 degrees on either side here. Okay, we have 60 in the right corner here and then another 60 here. Um, so yeah, we have basically 60, 60, 60. And when we have such a triangle, for example, even if we had an isosceles triangle, right, whereby these are the base angles being equal, then if I was to draw an altitude, which is, this is an altitude because it makes a right angle, then that altitude is also going to act as a median. And what that means is that it's going to be located at the midpoint of the bottom. So that, that's how I know this is also X, right? And we could also make an argument from this perspective of congruent triangles. So this triangle over here can be proven to be congruent to this one, okay? Um, I'll leave you to work that out on your own. But anyway, uh, once we have this so far, the next thing that we can do is to realize that the big triangle is equilateral. So this would also be 2x, okay? And by the way, you could do this with numbers as well, but I'm using x just to make it as the most abstract as possible so that our answer is applicable to a wide range of scenarios where this could be five, this could be 10, we don't really care. Um, and we'll see that again in a minute. So, okay. Now I know basically two out of the three sides of this triangle so I can figure out the altitude using Pythagorean theorem. So um, I'll just show what the details of that would look like in case if you're curious. So basically this is A, B and C. So, um, we just want to basically solve this for A. Okay. And we want to square root both sides. So we end up with A is equal the square root of 3x squared, which notice that we can actually break this into square root of x squared and square root of 3. And the square root of x squared is just x. So basically, this is um, x rad 3. That's the idea. So once we learn this, altitude is x rad 3. Now we have actually uh, a rule for 30, 60, 90. So if the opposite angle of 30 is called x, then the opposite from 90 degrees would be 2x, and the opposite from 60 degrees would be uh, x radical 3. All right, so we could lock in that rule. And then using this rule, we can figure out the sine and cosine for those angles. So let's try. Sine of 30 degrees. So this time we're going to look from this angle's perspective and we want to label. So we see that um, uh, maybe I should redraw just to make it a little more clear. So I'll, I'll redraw the picture over here. Whoops. Yeah, I'll go over here. So we have 30, 60, and 90. So um, we know this is x, this opposite of 60 is x red three, and the opposite from 90 would be the two x side. So if I wanna do the sine of 30, then I'm looking from this angle's perspective. This would be opposite, right? And then the hypotenuse is here. So the opposite is x and the hypotenuse is two x, right? We remember sine is opposite over hypotenuse, okay? Now notice that the x's will cancel and you'll just be left with one half. So we learned the sine of 30 is one half. And you can do the same thing for the sine of 60 um, by starting looking at the other angle. But first, let me do actually the cosine of um, 30. All right, so for the cosine of 30, instead of using opposite over hypotenuse, I'll use adjacent over hypotenuse. So the adjacent side is x rad 3, and the hypotenuse is 2x. Right, so we end up with radical 3 over 2. Right, red three over two. Um, so yeah, now we have exact values for the sine and cosine of 30 degrees. Notice that this is even better than the calculator because the calculator will just read out something like 0.866 and then a whole bunch of decimal values. But no matter how many decimal places you put, it's never gonna be as exact as this number here, right? Because it's an irrational number, it goes on forever as a decimal. So if you want an exact value, which a lot of the questions will ask for, then you have to use radical form like so. And that's why knowing how to simplify radicals, rationalizing denominators, all those skills come into play in this chapter, all right? Um, so you have the sine and cosine of these values. Um, 
if you wanted, for example, to find the tangent, you could do that as well. So the tangent, you would just basically divide sine divided by cosine, okay? And then when you keep change flip, uh, you'll end up with basically this and the twos would cancel. One over radical three is what you'd get. And then we have to rationalize. So we end up with rad three over three, okay? So that's the sine, cosine, and tangent um, of 30 degrees. Now, if you wanted to find the values for 60, then you could do the same process starting with 60 degree as your starting angle. However, there is a much more efficient way if you know about the idea of co-functions, okay? So the idea of co-functions is that if you have two angles that are the acute angles in a right triangle, then they have to be complementary, right? So for example, 30 and 60, they add up to 90, okay? Um, but what you can notice is that if I was to look at the uh, sine of 30, right? Sine of 30 is gonna be opposite over hypotenuse. Um, so it's going to be sort of X over two X. But then if I was to look at actually the cosine of 60, notice that if I look at from angle 60's perspective, this side becomes the adjacent side. So the only thing that switches when I go from 30 degree angles perspective to 60 degree angles perspective is that now um, what used to be the opposite side is now gonna become the adjacent side. Okay, so this adjacent over hypotenuse is actually gonna come out the exact same as we got for the sine of 30 degrees, right? So in particular, I'll spell it out here. We end up getting X for the adjacent and two X for the hypotenuse. And this will always happen, right? Anytime you have a right triangle, it'll always be the case that these two angles will be complementary, and therefore the sine of one of them will equal the cosine of the other. So let's write that down. And that's the definition of co-functions. Okay. So when two angles are complementary, meaning that they add to 90, um, what will happen? Well, basically the cosine of one will always equal the sine of the other and vice versa, okay? So what we learned from this is that once I have the sine, or sorry, the uh, yeah, we have the sine of 30. So the sine of 30, right, would have to equal the cosine of blank. And we can answer these kind of questions now because we know that sine and cosine are called co-functions, by the way. So sine and cosine, now you finally, are seeing why it's called that way, right? Is because they are co-functions, all right? And what that means is that they operate in this way where if you look at the angles, if the angles happen to add up to 90, then the sine of one equals the cosine of the other. So you just wanna make sure that you are putting a number in here, which will add up to 90 with this, and that is 60, right? So anyway, all this is to say that the sine of 30 is equal to the cosine of 60, which is equal to one half. And the cos of 30 has to be equal to the sine of 60, which equals to rad three over two. And uh, the tangent, the tangent of 60 would just um, end up being the reciprocal of this, right? So uh, you'll end up with radical three for the tangent of 60, okay? because it, you know three over rad three, again, you would rationalize. And then you get three rad three over three, and then the threes cancel, just leaving radical three. Okay, so now to update, we have the sine, cosine, and tangent of 30 and 60 to add to our list. So now at this point, we can make a really nice list here. So we have zero, 30, 45, 60, and 90. So this is the chart that we'll make for our first quadrant angles to summarize. We start with sine, cosine, and tangent. And I'll show you a little way of, you can remember all this information just in this one chart. So this is extremely important, this chart, okay? So this is your angle 
uh, your sine value, cosine value, tangent. So first of all, you start with the following pattern. You have to remember this, okay? Memorize basically this one thing and you'll be set for all of the first quadrant angles, okay? So the square root of zero over two, obviously that doesn't seem that important on its own, but then if I increment the numerator, watch the magical thing that happens, okay? So square root of zero over two, one over two, two over two, three over two, four over two. And then we kind of just see what each one of these evaluates to. So the square root of zero is zero and zero divided by two is zero, right? Square root of one is one, one divided by two is just a half. This one doesn't simplify, neither does this one, okay? But then this one, square root of four is two and two divided by two is one, okay? So this is giving us the first column in this chart, okay? So we can right away write down zero, one half, rad three over two, rad two over two, and one, okay? So this is a little memory trick, okay? And I think it will be very helpful if you just memorize this because notice how much work we had to do just to get to this point. So if you can just memorize this, then you can forget all about the special right triangle stuff, okay? Now, the next step is we're going to exploit the idea of co-functions, okay? So we know that anytime um, two angles add up to 90 degrees, the sine of one will equal the cosine of the other, right? So using that logic, what we can do is something pretty impressive here. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write this column upside down, zero, one half, uh, rad three over two, rad two over two and one. And this will be the correct values for the cosine of um, all those angles, okay? So all I did was I wrote this column upside down, okay? And we got this. Um, the reason why this works, by the way, is if we kind of draw a line here, we notice that this is actually symmetrical from top to bottom, right? So zero and 90, notice how they add up to 90 degrees, 60 and 30 add up to 90 degrees, and then 45 in itself add up to 90 degrees. So every pair of angles here adds up to 90, which means that every pair here um, can be switched to get you to the cosine. So it's a very neat symmetrical little trick here. And once we have all the sines and cosines figured out, the next step is to figure out the tangents. And we just have to remember that we just divide sine divided by cosine. So zero divided by one is zero. Okay. And then this one we already saw, but one half divided by uh, rad two over two, we do a keep change flip and we end up getting, uh, hang on a moment. Did I mess something up? Yeah, I did. Sorry about that. This should have been rad two over two. Whoops. Let me fix this. Yeah, that's my mistake. That should have been rad two over two. And yeah, I also messed these ones up. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so this should have been rad two over two. Yeah, I must have rushed through this, guys. Sorry about that. So um, yeah, just to kind of go back for a moment. Zero, one, red two, red two, red three over two. Yeah, so I just didn't copy it correctly when I transcribed it over to here. So sorry about that, guys. But yeah, when you flip it upside down, it should come out correct. Now, anyway, we're dividing uh, this by this. And let me try and be a little neater here. So we have one half divided by red three over two. We keep change flip and these will cancel. We get one over rad three and we have to rationalize that. Whoops. So we get rad three over three, okay? Rad three over three. Now, anything divided by itself is just one. And notice that this one is gonna be the reciprocal of what we got above. This is just gonna be rad three instead of one over rad three. And then one over zero is just undefined, okay? So now we have completed our chart um, of all the angles in the first quadrant. So give yourself a nice pat on the back, right? Because now we figured out all of the fundamental angles of the first quadrant. And in addition, keep in mind that we also know the values of all the quadrantal angles. 
So we also have the 180 and 270 in our back pocket as well. So at this point, at this point, we want to um, learn about the next step, which is what we call reference angles. Okay. So reference angles are going to allow us to expand into the other quadrants the same way we expanded into this first quadrant. So if I start to fill out this picture a little bit here, now we know not only the quadrantal values, but we also know 60 degrees and 30 degrees, okay? So we have sort of three data points on the interior of the first quadrant. So what reference angles is gonna allow us to do is it's gonna allow us to take those three values that are on the interior and find three values in the interior of the second quadrant, third quadrant, and fourth quadrant, okay? So we're gonna multiply our successes, if you will. So let's look at what that entails over here. So we'll start with a pretty simple example just to get ourselves going here. So let's say we have here a 30 degree angle. Um, whoops. And by the way, if you guys are curious about what I was mentioning earlier as to why, uh, you know, why this coordinates would represent the sine and cosine, I'll explain that now. So um, assuming that this is a unit circle, right, then the length of this hypotenuse here would be one. And then the length of this, you can just call it sort of X and Y for the moment, because um, this point is gonna be X comma Y. Now, if we do a little bit of analysis here, we'll see that uh, the cosine of 30, remember cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, so that's going to be X over one. And then the sine of 30 is going to be opposite over hypotenuse, so that's gonna be Y over one. So we see that the X value is cosine of 30. So this is what I forgot to explain before in the very beginning, okay? But basically now you see why it works. Why is the X and Y coordinate equal to the cosine and sine of the values, all right? Um, okay, so let me now just sort of start from where we left off. Uh, yeah, so assuming all of this, 30 degrees. Now, um, I know the values for 30 degrees, right? But what I would like to know is sort of the following stuff. We can make sort of a bow tie here. I'll explain how I'm doing this in a moment. But basically, I can take a 30 degree measurement um, from both the positive x-axis and also the negative x-axis. So one thing to really keep in mind when it comes to reference angles is we always, always, always measure the angles with respect to the uh, x-axis, x-axis. It doesn't have to always be the positive x-axis. Uh, we could also measure it with respect to the negative x-axis, okay? But anyway, our first angle is 30 degrees, right? So what I claim to you guys, and I will prove it, is that if I know the sine of 30 degrees, then I also know the sine of all of these other angles, okay? That make a 30 degree angle with the X axis, either positive X axis or negative X axis, either a positive 30 degrees or in this case, a negative 30 degrees, okay? But any angle that measures 30 degrees with respect to this um, X axis is gonna have the same value for the sine of 30 um, up to a minus sign. So anyway, let's remember that the sine of 30 is one half, okay? So it turns out uh, that all of these angles have something to do with one half, the, the sines, I should say. So the sine of 30 degrees is equal to one half, okay? And the sine of this angle, which you can think of as being either negative 30 degrees, or as we mentioned before, we could go around all the way around this way. And notice that it's 30 degrees short of 360, right? Which would be a full circle. So this is 330 degrees. By the way, a little trick is you can simply add 360 to this and you'll get uh, what's called a coterminal. Coterminal angles 
are angles that terminate in the same location, okay? So these are called cold terminals and you can add or subtract 360 and you can do this multiple times uh, to figure out coterminals. And coterminals always have the same um, value for the sine and cosine and tangent because they end up at the same place. So they're basically the same angle, okay? Um, so anyway, both of these I claim have a sine equal to one half, right? Um, now, on the other hand, the angles here on the left side, so the sine of this angle 30, so if we notice uh, the actual degree measurement for this angle is 30 degrees short of 180, right? If my green arrow, which always we start measuring from the positive x-axis, if it made it all the way to the negative x-axis, that would be 180 degrees. So this is 30 shy of 180, so the actual angle here is 150 degrees, okay? And if I continue that same thought process, okay, the actual angle over here is 30 degrees beyond 180. So this angle would be 210, okay? So we have 210 degrees here. So I claim, again, I haven't proven it yet, but I claim that these are gonna be negative one half, both of them, okay? So now let me get into my proof and then we'll uh, abstract this so that we know the values also for the, cos uh, the uh, 60 degree and 45 degrees uh, reference angles. Okay, so the first thing that I will claim to you, and I think this will help you maybe conceptualize on a larger sort of scale what's going on, is I want you to recall that the x value um, was equal to the cosine and the y value was equal to the sine of the angle, right? So we just explained that uh, a few minutes ago as to why that is the case. Um, but we're going to kind of use that to help us, guide us here. So we're going to think of sort of our x and y axes like sine and cosine, okay? Um, oh, did I make a mistake here? Yeah, sorry. I was actually meaning to, um, yeah, maybe I need to flip these. So this one is positive one half. Sorry about that. And this one is negative one half. Yep, so we all make mistakes sometimes, uh, as you can see. But anyway, let me explain how I just figured that out. So in particular, the y-axis here is representing the value of the sine uh, of the angle. So anything that's above the y-axis, or excuse me, anything above the x-axis um, has to have a positive y-value, okay? So notice that the y-value of this location and of this location is positive. And since the y value represents the sine, the sine has to be positive in both of these quadrants. Um, so we understand that it's gonna be positive. That's how I caught my mistake. But let me explain now how I'm figuring out that it's equal uh, to one half. So you can draw what's called a reference triangle. So that's what we're doing here. And I mean, it turns out that these triangles are in fact congruent, but um, maybe it's tricky to prove that uh, a little bit. But anyway, we can start from first principles, right? So we have a 30 degree angle here and we know it's a 30, 60, 90 triangle. So we can, again, sort of remember like, you know, this is X and this is two X. So opposite over hypotenuse is gonna be one half, okay? So we just can make those little reference triangles to help us out. Uh, at any rate, we know that um, these triangles are congruent and therefore, I mean, they're gonna have all the same values. So if I know the sine of 30 is half over here, same thing is gonna apply on this triangle, right? They're virtually identical. Um, okay. So let's look at another example. Uh, actually, let me just finish this up, did I? Uh, yeah, I guess I did, okay. Uh, this is gonna be negative, by the way, these two, because we're below the x-axis and um, therefore, the y values are going to be negative for these two points here and here. And remember, the y value represents the sine of that angle. Okay. So let me uh, re repeat this with 60 degrees. Oops. So now, if I look at a 60 degree angle, notice the reference angles would look like this. Okay, because this is 60 degrees from the positive x-axis. So I can make a 60 degree angle to the negative x-axis. 
okay? And I could make negative angles as well, measuring 60 degrees, okay? So this is what is often referred to as the bow tie. So this is my bow tie here. And these four triangles are the reference triangles, okay? These 60 degree angles are the reference angles. So now we wanna find out what the actual angles are of these sort of vectors. So I'm just gonna draw the vectors like we did before. Okay. If you don't know what vectors is, just think of them as like little spinners on a board. You can kind of flick it and it spins around. Okay. Um, that's all you need to think about it as. So anyway, 60 degrees here. So what would be the angle measurement for this? Well, we need to start from the positive x axis and go all the way over to here, right? So we know that we're going past 90 degrees, okay? And notice that this angle here would have to be 30 degrees, this uh, angle here, because this one is 60. So that's one way to think about it is it's going to be 90 plus 30 or 120. Um, it's not really the way that I think about it, so I'll share with you how I think about it. Um, whoops, let's put that back. All right, so the way that I think about it is that this angle, this red line here, is 60 degrees shy of what would be 180, right? So it's um, basically 180 minus 60. And then this guy is always gonna be 60 beyond 180, so that's 180 plus 60 or 240. And for this one, it's 60 degrees shy of 360, so this would be 300. So my claim to you guys is that all of these angles will have the same values of sines and cosines. Oh, I forgot to mention over here maybe that the cosines of uh, these angles would also uh, all be equal. But I'll mention that in summary. All right, so here is my claim. Once I know, for example, the sine of 60 degrees, that will equal the sine of all these other angles. So the sine of 120, the sine of uh, 240, and the sine of 300. So these angles form like a family, basically. The 60, 120, 240, and 300. They form a family. Now, it would be easy if these were all, in fact, equal, but there is a slight problem with this, which is that it's actually not true, okay? So instead, instead, some of these are negative, in fact. And to figure out which ones are negative, um, we can use the principle that we outlined earlier, right? And that principle is that anything above the x-axis is going to have a positive value for sine because the sine is effectively the y value, right? And the cosine is the x value. So since the sine is the y value, remember everything above the x-axis has positive y values. So these two guys are gonna have positive values for sine, okay? So the sine of 60 will be positive and the sine of 120 will be positive, whereas these guys are going to end up being negative because notice they are located below the x-axis. Okay, so they're gonna have negative y values. So anyway, we recall from our chart that the sine of 60 is rad three over two. So that means that the sine of 120 is also gonna be rad three over two. And then the sine of these guys is going to be negative rad three over two, okay? All right, so using our knowledge of reference angles and the fact that we have figured out sine of 60 already, now we know, excuse me, we know the sine of 120, uh, 240, and 300. And this is also true for the cosine as well. So if I know the cosine of 60 is a half, then I know the other guys are also one half, but they might be negative. So let's look at those values. We have 120, all right, we have 240, and we have 300. Um, so the cosine of 60 is one half. That's from the chart, okay, that we memorized. The cosine of 120, notice that 120 is on the left side. So when it comes to the cosine, we are considering, are you left side or right side? Because we're really looking at the X values. So notice that this point would have a negative X value because it's to the left of the picture. So anything on the left side of the picture will have a negative 
sign. So the 240 would also get a negative and these two would be positive, okay? So there we go. We have all the values we needed and to figure out the tangents, we could just start dividing these guys, right? For the tangent of 60. All right, so let us recap what we've got so far. So if I start drawing my unit circle, okay? Um, what we have so far is we know the value of zero degrees, we know 90, we know 180, and we know 270, okay? So in addition to that, we also know 30, 45, and 60. Now, once we did 30, we also figured out a few more that belong to the same family, right? So this one is 30 shy of 180, so that's 150. 30 beyond 180 is 210. Okay, and 30 short of 360 is 330. So we have those figured out. Uh, in addition, we did the 60 degree family. And let me change the color here so that it becomes a little more clear. But the 60 degree family looks like this. You have 60 and then you have 60 shy of 180 is 120. 60 beyond 180 is 240. And then 60 short of 360 is 300. Okay. And now you can see where this is going is that we can figure out the values uh, of the family of 45 degrees as well. So let me switch to a different color here and we'll fill in the 45 values as well. Okay. And for 45, the reference angles um, is 45 shy of 180, which is 135. Here we get uh, 225 and here we get 315. Okay. So in uh, sort of review here, if we wanted the sign of, for example, 315 degrees, we notice that this is one of the reference angles in the 45 degree family. So we know that this is equal to the sign of 45 degrees, except it might be negative. So you could write, for example, plus or minus this, okay? And to figure out which one, um, we would just realize that we're doing the sign, so we wanna know about the y value. Am I above or below the, the x-axis? In this case, I'm below the x-axis. So that means that the sign is going to be negative. And then we look up on the chart, the sign of 45, and we find it's red two over two. Okay, so that's how we can very quickly determine the sine and cosine of all of these angles, okay? So we started with nothing. Just remember back to the beginning of the lesson. We had absolutely no knowledge of the sine, cosine, and tangent of anything. Then we analyzed the unit circle and using sort of the basic definition of sine and cosine and the fact that the hypotenuse was one, we were able to determine these quadrantal angles, 0, 90, 180, and 270. Uh, next, we basically used, um, um, we used uh, special right triangles, right, to figure out these guys. Um, from there, we used reference angles to fill in the other uh, inner quadrantal angles, okay? Um, so yeah, we've come quite a decent way from here. Now, also keep in mind that we have figured out other things as well, which is to say we know how to do negative angles, right? So if I was given negative 30, I know that I should add um, 360 degrees to that, right? and then I get 330, or I can immediately realize that this is equal to plus or minus the sine of 30 because it's immediately a reference angle, right? In the 30 degree family. Um, from here, I know the sine of 30 is one half, okay? And I know this is below the axis, so it's negative. Now, your teacher may tell you something about ASTC, all students take calculus or you know some mnemonic device to remember uh, the signs of the various quadrants. So I'll explain this part as well, just in case, um, so you don't get confused in class, but basically the idea is this, A stands for all. So that means that all um, trig functions are gonna be positive. Oops. So yeah, all trig functions are gonna be positive. The sine trig functions are gonna be positive here. 
tangents are going to be positive here, and cosine is going to be positive here. So the ASTC stands for all sine, tangent, and cosine. And it tells you which trig functions are positive in that quadrant. So for example, if I was looking at this one, then it tells me that the cosine value is positive. And that makes sense because notice that this point has a positive x value, OK? The y value, of course, is negative. And that's why the sine is actually not going to be positive. It's going to be negative, OK? So anything that's not positive, by the way, is negative. Okay. So in this quadrant, notice that the cosine is actually going to be negative, And that's because we're over to the left of the picture. That is to say, the x value is negative. So if you understand what I explained to you already, then you don't need ASTC. But if that was confusing, um, ASTC is a good fallback. All right. Um, good. Now from here, the other thing that we know is we know angles that are beyond 360. So if I did, for example, 390, uh, and I wanted to know the cosine of that, then I want to find the coterminal. So I subtract 360 from this, and that gets me 30 degrees. And this time, I don't need the plus or minus, because since these are coterminal angles, right, coterminal, then I know for a fact um, that they're going to be equal. They're going to exactly be equal, not even plus or minus, OK? So right away, I look up on my chart, the cosine of 30. And that's the benefit of having the chart. Um, and the cosine of 30 is a half, right? So no, sorry, rad 3 over 2. OK, so eventually you'll memorize the chart. And you won't have to look it up. But for now, looking it up is fine. So when you get your test, the first thing you do is make your chart, OK? And then everything you end up getting is going to come back to you know being in terms of sines and cosines uh, of your basic angles. OK. Um, beyond this, the next level would be trying to figure out um, other angles. For example, if you wanted to find the cosine of 15 degrees, OK, there's no simple way to do it. But this is where you get into the whole, you know, cosine of uh, theta over 2, right, the half angle formulas. And this is where it gets a little bit ugly because Maybe there's no easy way, or at least I don't know of an easy way of uh, deriving these from first principles. Um, and then you know you have your double angle formulas. Uh, you also have your angle addition and angle subtraction formulas, right? So the whole thing with that is you either just have to memorize it or just have it as a reference, uh, the equations, because I, I don't remember these. And I think hardly anybody ever does. But maybe this is something like cos A cos B minus sine A sine B. That's how they look like, but this is probably completely wrong. Um, but yeah, anyway, the benefit of these formulas, right? The half angles, the double angle formulas, right? Um, and this one, the sum and difference formulas. The benefit of these is that using what we know now, we can actually access even more information. For example, if you know the half angle formula, then you can start with the cosine of 30 degrees and use the half angle formula, right, to figure out the cosine of 15. And for example, you can then uh, maybe figure out 75 degrees. Once you have the cosine of 15 degrees, um, you know, you can use, whoops, so you can use a whole bunch of ideas here, but maybe cos of 30 plus 45, right? to figure out 75. So you don't even need 15, because we know 30, we know 45. So you can use like an angle sum formula to figure out 75, uh, the cosine of 75, rather. OK, so you can imagine that you can now unlock pretty much any angle you can think of with some work uh, once you have these formulas down. OK, so I'll wrap up there for today. And uh, good luck.